Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Thanks for joining us for our second installment of Elseworlds, a series brought to you by our backers at Patreon. In Elseworlds, we'll be doing deep dives into the amazing catalog of DC animated movies. My name is Rich, and this week, I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. In this series, we'll be discussing the comic history that inspired the movies, how the stories might have been changed or updated, and in some cases, how they have inspired or will inspire storylines on Young Justice. Probably not that one, but maybe not maybe one. not that last one this time. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe <laughs> season three could be very strange. Uh, but unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a crashing the mode segment. So consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And as an added note for this particular episode, Gotham by Gaslight, the movie that we're talking about, is rated R. And although we will be avoiding any graphic descriptions, the content of this episode may walk the line for some of our youngest listeners. So just keep that in mind. Go home. Am home. Home to mommy. She ain't got one. None of us do. Or we run off from something even worse than this. This is our family now, making something here, taking something back from Gotham. Make something else, something better. And with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's hand it off to Emily for... Hello, Megan! Uh, so the title of the movie that we are watching this week is Batman Gotham by Gaslight, and the release date was January 12th of 2018. It had a couple of release dates, but that's what I'm going with. That was the first time it was shown. Then it was on digital, and then it was on Blu-ray on three different dates, but we're going with that one. Nice. Uh, the director is uh, Sam Liu, and the voice director is Wes Gleason. Our voice cast includes uh, Young Justice's own Batman, Bruce Greenwood. He's a good Batman. He is a good Batman. Anthony Stewart Head, uh, who you may remember from as being Giles from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, playing Alfred, which is fantastic. Yes. Uh, Jennifer Carpenter, who played uh, Deborah on um, the TV show Dexter, Dexter's sister, playing Selena Kyle. John DiMaggio, the famous and awesome John DiMaggio, playing uh, Harvey Bullock. Scott Patterson, who was Luke from Gilmore Girls. Yeah. The coffee shop guy playing Jim Gordon. <laughs> that was a Hello. weird thing to realize on IMDb today. <laughs> Stepping out of his role a little bit. Gray Griffin, who has played uh, Daphne in Scooby-Doo, Wonder Woman, played Catwoman. She's played uh, several versions of Captain Marvel, the female Captain Marvel from Marvel Comics, not the Captain Marvel we know from DC. Uh, did the voice of Sister Leslie Tompkins, Yuri Lowenthal, <laughs> Lagoon Boy, and uh, <laughs> also Superman in um, the Legion of Superheroes animated series. He is doing the voice of Harvey Dent. Uh, and Tara Strong as Marlene Mahoney, and uh, the voice of Tim Drake, of course, Tara doing Harley Quinn. You can kind of hear the Harley in her voice here in this part too, which is pretty great. Tara is a Tara is a fantastic voice actor, but like you can pick her voice out in a crowd. Yeah, it's it's tough. I have to say though, man, like John DiMaggio didn't quite pick him out as Bullock. It took me uh, the second viewing before I realized that was Anthony Head playing um, Alfred. Did not recognize Scott Pete Patterson in any way. <laughs> I so, recognized Greg Griffin immediately because oh, I'm just yeah. She does well, she she's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, she's she's one of those voice actresses where I'm like, oh look, it's Azula. <laughs> oh, oh, she did Azula. Yes, you'd think I'd that remember was, that. That was like my first introduction to her, and it's like oh. she's fantastic. But then Azula. like everything afterwards, I'm like, oh look, <laughs> it's From her. Avatar, Avatar: The Last Airbender. She is crazy, Azula. She's fantastic. Oh, so she's and so good. Terrifying. Absolutely. But we're not talking both about of, Avatar. 
both We're those things. We're talking about Batman. Yeah, that's, gonna, that's a different podcast. Just in time for your next mission. So our opening scene for Gotham by Gaslight is that at an exotic dance hall, we see uh, Pamela Isley, Poison Ivy, uh, dancing for patrons attending the theater. Uh, she then exits the hall into the foggy night and she runs into a shadowed figure with a medical bag. And we as the viewer know this cannot end well. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? Uh, then a few streets over, uh, three street urchins attempt to rob a couple when Batman arrives and he disarms the orphans who turn out to be Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, and Jason Todd and cripples their handler, uh, Big Bill Dust, because that's a name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before telling all three of them to go find Sister Leslie at the orphanage. Uh, we then hear Ivy scream and Batman arrives too late to save her. The next day at the upcoming Gotham Fairgrounds, Mayor Tolliver is speaking to a gathering of investors and influential Gothamites. Selina Kyle and Sister Leslie Tompkins arrive to call out Commissioner Gordon and Chief Bullock about the Jack the Ripper murderers. Bruce Wayne also arrives, and we learn that Sister Leslie took care of Bruce after his parents were killed, which tracks with the regular comics as well. We also learn he's been uh, supporting the orphanage financially. We find out that Jack the Ripper has been murdering destitute women. Uh, then later that night, Selina puts herself up for bait for Jack. Batman follows, and the two are both nearly killed by the Ripper before <laughs> the murderer manages to get away. Batman then arrives at Commissioner Gordon's house and makes an uneasy alliance with the law with law enforcement. So we can kind of tell early on that this is kind of a new shtick for him. He doesn't really have a relationship built up quite yet. Gordon agrees to help Batman, but threatens that that help may be temporary. In our next scene, Bruce and Harvey Dent attend a show at the Monarch Theater, where Selina is performing. Uh, after the show, Bruce and Selina bond, including finding out that they were both helped as orphans by Sister Leslie. Bruce realizes that there is a connection between Leslie and many of the murdered women and rushes off to the orphanage to protect her. But by the time he gets there, Leslie has already been killed. At the funeral, Hugo Strange suggests to Bruce that he knows who Jack the Ripper really is and tells Bruce to tell Batman to meet him at his office at midnight. Uh, Bruce then is confronted by a drunk woman who saw him at the orphanage and who thinks he killed Leslie Tompkins. Alfred is nearly pickpocketed by Jason Todd at the funeral as well, but is talked out of calling the police by Dick Grayson. Alfred offers Jason, Dick, and Tim odd jobs in exchange for food and gives them his like little business card, little Victorian business <laughs> card. <laughs> you will not go away hungry. At just before midnight that night, Jack the Ripper arrives at Hugo's office instead of Batman and throws Hugo to his own patients. Uh, Batman arrives too late to save Hugo, but chases Jack, getting wounded in the chase. Selina saves Bruce, but uh, in the process discovers his secret identity. The next morning, Bullock arrives at Selina's apartment to arrest Bruce for the murder of Marlene, the drunk woman from the funeral who uh, had been found dead the night before. Since Bruce has contacts with a number of the women uh, that had been murdered and has no alibi because of his Batman activities, he's put in prison without bail. Selina comes to see him in prison to convince him to escape, but when he refuses, she says she'll tell Gordon he's Batman to get him out of prison because Batman was clearly uh, somewhere else when many of these murders took place. Uh, she wants him to break out of prison and help find the real killer. When she leaves, Bruce bribes a guard to get a message to Alfred for him, then manages to start a prison brawl, steal guards' clothes, and escape. W willing to escape on his own, but when Selena's like, you need to break out of prison, he's like, I can't do that until he does. Right. Well, he's, he said I can't do it because, uh, you know, secret identity and reasons and I don't know. Because I, reasons. I don't know. Because kind of some reasons. And then he breaks out to stop. Her? I, it is a little confusing. We'll get into that. <laughs> it's it's fine. Everything is fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, our little gang of Victorian Street Orphan Robins, uh, on behalf of Alfred, deliver a huge box and a smaller package to an abandoned alley. Uh, the small package is taken by someone off screen, and the three unload the heavier box into the alley when Bruce, now dressed as Batman, presumably having 
taken his costume off of this <laughs> delivery small package right <laughs> uh tells them that they did a good job and sends them on their merry way uh bruce then heads to gordon's house to find selena but instead he finds a secret room in gordon's house and is confronted by gordon's wife barbara in the secret room we find out gordon was an award-winning boxer and a surgical assistant during the battle of antietam Barbara then reveals burns on the side of her face hidden beneath her hair and talks about the sins of woman being the worst of humans and explains that Gordon is apparently the only good man in Gotham and is doing a holy work cleaning the streets. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, <laughs> Selena has finally found Gordon. At the Gotham Fairgrounds, Uh, she tells him that Bruce is Batman. Then Gordon, now that we know that he's Jack the Ripper, uh, surprises her, injecting her with a 7% solution of laudanum, uh, which is a (laughs) drug that has basically all the opioids in it. And they and they casually mention it's like it's for insomnia. I'm like, you've also mentioned that oh, yeah. what you've just given her includes heroin. The heroin. Victorian era was crazy. Yeah, it was good. It was a good time to be alive. No, it was not. Just don't. Don't. It's not good. She manages to fight it off for a time, even making a crude bat signal out of a new high-powered spotlight that's at the fair. We then cut to Batman riding on a steampunk-style motorcycle, which was really cool. Uh, delivered apparently in the crate uh, by the Robins uh, from Alfred. Selina is finally overcome by the drug within one of the cars of the huge Ferris wheel. That's when Batman arrives and Gordon explains his motivations during the fight, uh, born from the horrors of the Civil War. Uh, A fire started by a broken lamp then spreads through the entire Ferris wheel, and Selina manages to fight off the drug long enough to escape. Uh, Gordon gets the upper hand during the fight and handcuffs himself to Batman, but then Batman manages to escape the handcuffs and uh, cuff Gordon to the railing of the Ferris wheel. But instead of being willing to be turned into the police, Gordon chooses suicide and backs into the fire, never to be seen again (laughs) in this film. Uh, Selina helps Batman out of the range of the giant burning Ferris wheel as it falls Normal things, normal date night things. Right. Uh, And the two are then rescued by Alfred and the orphans. And with with uncharacteristic optimism, uh, Jason ends the film by saying it was all phony anyway. We make something new, something better, nodding to a brighter future for this historic Gotham. Nice. Relatively happy ending. Relatively. Yeah. Well, the world's burning down around them, but yeah. Yeah, but you know, optimism. Optimism. Good future. I always turn to Jason Todd for a little uplifting word. Don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> it's been, feel that aster. Super boy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. I'll start with a few things, actually. Go for it. Yeah. I really enjoyed this movie. It's not like the it's not like the comic, and I had some issues, but overall. I thought they did a really pretty good job of kind of merging together um, some of the storylines from the comic and then adding their own twist to it. So overall, I liked it. Um, Some of the things I really liked were a lot of the nods. So Sister Leslie Tompkins in the comic, she's actually a doctor. She was Bruce's godmother and a friend of Thomas Wayne. And then in here, obviously, she's a nun with an orphanage and kind of used that to tie in a lot of the connections. So like Bruce knew Pamela Isley because they both had been at the orphanage or at least she, he knew her because she had been at the orphanage or that kind of thing. And then having Catwoman be at the orphanage for a while too, like after Bruce, that was really interesting twist as well. Hugo strange being like not only the head therapist, psychologist at, um, at Arkham Asylum. I don't think he was in the actual regular comic, but also being an alienist. So he's kind of like a profiler basically for the police. And I love how he basically implies heavily that he knows that Bruce is Batman and says he knows who Jack the Ripper is, too. Like, suddenly, like, what, Hugo, Hugo Strange, how did you get so competent all of a sudden? Like, kind of horrified by how competent <laughs> you are right now. At least in so, that aspect, uh, as a therapist in Arkham Asylum, you, your um, therapeutic techniques leave something to be, you know, improved on. Yeah, but it was it was that era, so, you know. 
kind of was. Things were never great. It's not good. No, patients don't do well under those circumstances, professionally no. speaking. No. Bullock, having Harvey Bullock in there was great. Mayor Tolliver, who was uh, Police Commissioner Tolliver in the original comic that was focusing on Jack. There was also a second kind of story in there, too, that had that took place later in the timeline where the commissioner had become the mayor, you know, so they kind of folded that in. Cyrus Gold, uh, the guy that Bruce uses to start the prison riot. Cyrus Gold's the name of the guy who becomes Solomon Grundy. He's the name of the criminal that gets murdered and thrown in the swamp. Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of, like, I, I love when I read these historical pieces or these, like, these uh, reimaginings. And they fold in the characters and they do such a good job. Like, what would they be like in this particular era? Or, you know, what what does this myth look like in that? And I just, I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Same. They had some other stuff, too, that was even that was even more subtle, like the Rose Tavern. Like, Bruce grabs a, he grabs a jacket from the Rose Tavern, like, after he's running from the police right before Selena finds him. He takes the mask yeah. off. He's got his costume still on, which is why Selena knows who he is when she finds him. But he grabs something from the Rose Tavern, and uh, it's interesting because I didn't really think about it, but it makes sense. Like the there, there are some locations like the Monarch Theater and the Rose Tavern that are in Gotham City that would that were established now or eighteen nineties, whenever it's supposed to be, and uh, existed in the modern era. And the Rose Tavern was actually um, becomes it's like a restaurant, it's like a high end restaurant in in Gotham. And it's, funnily enough, the first time we kind of get the, in Batman the Animated Series, there's an episode where they introduce Pamela Isley having a relationship with Harvey Dent. And this is before Harvey Dent became Two-Face in the Animated Series. And they spent time building up this friendship between Bruce and Harvey, which was great, several episodes of it. But they are, he meets them, he introduces Bruce to Pamela at the Rose Cafe, I think they call it, or the Rose, something like that. And then the Monarch Theater is the theater that theoretically they were seeing, you know, Zorro at when they came out and Bruce's parents were killed. So, like, there's just lots of nods. There's only one theater and one restaurant in all of Gotham City. <laughs> you have to use both of them. Right. Well, you know, got to fold in. If you're going to fold in all the villains and make them appropriate in some way, <laughs> might as well fold the locations in, too. Might as well. Might as well. Yeah, and there's a, there's some other stuff too. I want to hear some of your stuff though, and then we'll talk about maybe some of the few things that I had a few issues with, or that I thought were really odd or interesting about how they changed changed stuff and didn't change stuff. So there's like the main thing I love about this that we'll get to because I'm predictable, but there are a bunch of other little things that I really liked about this movie because like I agree with you, it's not it's not perfect. It's not mm -hmm. a perfect film. But I still had a lot of fun with it. So I really enjoyed it overall. But I really like that they have a lot of these really humanizing relationships for Bruce in this film that I yeah. feel like a lot of things like would just brush over. Like they have the tiny gang of Robins that are adorable and I love them. Uh, excuse um, me. The co they're called the Cock Robins. <laughs> That's what Big Bill Dust calls them is you interfering with my, with my Cock Robins, which I think was great. Male, ro my little, my little band of male robins. I love it. <laughs> Even though at least two of them are voiced by women, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. No, two of them were because yeah. uh, Tara Strong voiced one, and then Gray voiced one as well. I think. I don't know yep. who voiced. I think she voiced Tim. I don't know who voiced Jason. I think some. Yeah, it's somebody. I think it's Tim and Jason are both voiced by women, uh, which just amuses me because it happens in animation. We go with it, but still, when That's I can funny. tell, it amuses me. But I love his relationship with Leslie. I I love that like she shows up and <laughs> she shows up at the World's Fair and they're like, yeah, we were just about to ask these women to leave. And Bruce is like, uh, no, this is Leslie. She's my friend. Shut up. She stays. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. And she like she's one of those characters who treats him like a human. And I love seeing that when there are people who don't treat Bruce like he's either the best or worst thing to ever happen to the city. She's like, no, he's just a person. He's a kid I looked after. He's my friend. Uh, and they do the same thing with Alfred. And I love seeing that when like Bruce and Alfred get to have a friendship. It's good. More, more media that acknowledges this, please. <laughs> Alfred is not just a servant. He is Bruce's friend. Exactly. And so all of those were great. And I loved seeing all of those throughout the movie. 
A fun fact about this that I found when I was doing way too much historical research on this film, like (laughs) I was posting about it on Twitter. I was like looking things up and doing research on this genuinely. But one thing I found out that amused me at least uh, was that the song that they have Selena sing in the Monarch Theater is an actual real song uh, that exists. They didn't write it for the film. They found a song uh, that's called Can You Tame Wild Women? And it's by a man named Billy Murray. And it's an actual song from around 1918. So not the Victorian era that this is kind of set and inspired in a few right. few decades later. But I just thought it was music. It was like, hey, you found a real song and then figured out a way to fit it into your film. I appreciate it. Wow, that's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was like, oh, they probably just wrote this. They probably just wrote some weird little little like show tune that they could throw in here and had some cats in it so that they could make it cat woman right. But no, nah, real song. Fun fact. We have, we have Google now. You can type in weird cat songs from <laughs> 1900 plus minus 20. Uh, that would be that would be hilarious if that was how this went down. <laughs> but I also I just love the look of this film. I love yep. the aesthetics in this film. I agree. Like the I have it. I had one note when I was initially watching it that was just like the architecture is so cool. Like you just get these like panning shots of Gotham, and I'm like, this just looks cool. And like the fact that because of the era it's set in, they have to do so much brutal action that's very low tech. Like no one has like laser weapons or like actual effective guns that much, right. really. Everybody's just punching each other in the face and it looks cool because it's well choreographed. Yeah, and the the fighting, the 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 choreography and the fight scenes were so interesting because I mean, most of it is just is boxing. That's what they did. Right. Yeah. So most of it's boxing with a little bit of street fighting. And Bruce, even Bruce is largely boxing, but he incorporates some things that people don't expect. Like yeah. when he's fighting Cyrus, he like grabs his head and shoves his knee into his face. And I think and you could see the look on his face like, what was that? Like, <laughs> you know, that was that's not a thing. People don't do that. You know, so he's got some of these, you know, martial arts techniques because in the Gotham by Gaslight comic, he spent five years traveling around the world and. I, I'm sure he studied martial arts and everything else, but they, in the beginning of the Gotham by Gaslight comic, they show him actually uh, leaving Sigmund Freud's office, like <laughs> that he had studied with Freud. Oh, gosh. And as a, as a patient, kind of, sort of, because of his parents' death and that kind of stuff. And then they make reference to other things, too. He, t- he says something like, I paid Houdini $300 for that trick when he yeah. gets out of the handcuffs and hooks him onto the, the rail. Um, the one that gets me, though, too, because I'm a Holmes fan, is the Sherlock Holmes reference where he says, you know, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever's left, no matter how, improb- how improbable must be the truth. Classic, classic Holmes line. Yeah, which briefly made me pause because I was like, I know this is a Sherlock Holmes line, but I am questioning whether or not you're implying that Bruce knows Arthur Conan Doyle or if Bruce knows Sherlock Holmes, because they Mm -hmm. could get away with either, and I'm not sure which one they're going for, because Sherlock Holmes is public domain at this point, so you can just put him in things. (laughs) Well, that's fair. Was he public domain when the comic came out originally? I don't know. Maybe. Also, I think so. yeah, maybe. And I mean, you can, you could, you could just mention Sherlock Holmes, but I, I think it would be awkward, like from a writing standpoint, like, do, does, does he assume everybody knows Sherlock Holmes? Like, Houdini's famous. Yeah. Holmes is like a, a, the first, world's first private detective in London. Like, who would know him, right, in Gotham? So, I mean, I could see him, and it's not the point. It's just like, yeah. I just thought it, it just amused me for a second because yeah. I was like, I could believe either in this universe at this point. Absolutely. And I didn't think about that. But so I'm thinking about it like as a writer, like why would I do it that way instead of mentioning like name dropping Holmes? Because he, he doesn't say my mentor, insert name here. He just says my mentor says. Right. And, and the only reason... And then the only reason I would say that it's Holmes and not Doyle because one, it's... It's more interesting to me. <laughs> but two, Doyle, yeah, he was he was a writer of these mysteries, but he wasn't, like, it was one of his teachers at college that inspired this thought process that created Holmes. I don't think he's, it's not like he's Angela Lansbury. Like, I mean, I don't <laughs> think they would have, like, invited him to, like, solve some mysteries, you know, somewhere. I just don't, I don't know if he, like, personified that process that... 
I could be wrong, but I mean, he was not necessarily the most critical. I mean, he was definitely signed on to some entertaining, but not entirely accurate supernatural occurrences uh, at the of the day. So Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the big believer in logic and logically solving mysteries, also firmly believed fairies existed. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, the fairies were a big thing. fascinating man. I've yeah. watched a movie on that. <laughs> You've watched a movie on it. Yeah. Um, I cuz yeah. I'm fascinated by fairies. But yeah, I love as we were as you we were saying before we got off on our Sherlock Holmes tangent. <laughs> I I I love the look of this film and I love all of the references that they make in universe to like things from the 1800s that are all said as kind of serious lines but come off as jokes just because of how ridiculous they sound because we know things. Like there's some line where somebody's like, "Can the human body withstand ten miles per hour speeds?" <laughs> right, right, exactly. The human organs can withstand up to thirty five miles per hour. Enjoy the Ferris wheel. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. And I was I was dying laughing. Alfred has some line with like, "They'll never accept fingerprints as evidence, yeah, Bruce. Right, right. Those aren't a real thing." Are you testing your finger 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 theory? Yeah. Um, but along those lines, I also, I was talking about this briefly on Twitter earlier, uh, about how I love the costuming in this film in a lot of cases that they did really interesting things with how they designed everyone's clothes and designed everyone's costumes to like, they're not perfectly period accurate. My whole thing was going off a bit on Selena Kyle, but not for the reason that like some people might think because like her costume on the cover of this, of the DVD cover would have annoyed me like crazy if that was what they'd put her in in the actual in the actual movie but it's not in the actual movie she wears like a normal victorian dress for most of the film right the thing i was joking about is that to make sure that she can get access to her whip they have her have a thigh holster for it and a giant slit up the side of her dress i'm like no you would be kicked out of everywhere in Gotham if you were wearing this in the 1800s you you can't which i appreciate but as she's walking around you don't see it and so i'm i'm wondering if just like with batman right like she set herself up so yes there's a slit here but you can't tell like i have designed it so that it overlays in a way that i can get in to get the thing out like i'm trying to i i, I want to give her credit for that because i was you know when i was rewatching this again because I had seen it when it first came out. When I was rewatching this again, I was like, if she puts her hand in a pocket, I'm, I don't know, my head's going to explode. Because there's just no pockets, right? There That's were th- pockets. That were was they? the thing. I did, I did a whole research on this, and people following me on Twitter probably saw it. Oh, I, then I would have been just a troll. Because of my thought process here, I was like, hmm, I wonder if there was something more historically accurate they could have done than giving Selena Kyle a slit in her dress because they thought it would A, be easy, and B, make her hot. And I Googled it, and and Victorian women had secret pockets. Oh, secret pockets. Okay. Okay. And it was a thing. And, like, they changed where they were on dresses as dress styles evolved. But Selena Kyle, based on what she was wearing and what 30 minutes of research I did, could have easily had a pocket down the back of her dress that was, like, just below, like, where her skirt would have started. There could have easily been a pocket there that she could have just reached behind herself and pulled out a whip. And it would have been historically accurate, but no one would have believed it was historically accurate as right. part of it. Because everybody assumes women didn't have pockets. I feel like we were just talking about this, this idea that you can write a thing that, that literally happened to you and an editor will tell you to take it out because no one... It's like, but it really happened. It doesn't matter. No one is going to believe this. you got to take it pockets. out. Right, right. Well, I was reading a thing, and this could be totally apocryphal. I might... Might see if our friend Senda, who's like a dress pocket, <laughs> yeah, from uh, expert uh, from um, Pandas Talking Games, and she's a super geek. Ask her about this. But I was reading something that was something that said like the reason why women have tiny pockets that are super obnoxious is is because it was like a French um, fashion thing that came up because of they didn't want. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's got to be true. Like women carrying around salacious reading material i don't know how to else put that a lot of it was like political stuff and they oh yeah okay it was dirt because during the french revolution and it's one of those things where pockets on women's clothing have reappeared and disappeared throughout time and in different places they have like 
depending on your country, you may or may not have had pockets. Yeah. I find it so ridiculous that my my three-year-old son has workable pockets and a <laughs> zipper on his jeans, and my wife can't get a pocket. She could put anything more than a quarter in. It drives me crazy on her behalf. <laughs> Welcome to Well, to where we complain about pockets. Yes. But yeah, it was one of those things where like, and my, the other thing that I, that I said about this kind of issue where I love the costumes and I love everything Selena wears in this movie, except for this one decision about the slit up the side of her dress. And while there is some thought of like, well, maybe it's just like it's hidden, but like she's not, she's, she's not wearing like any layers under that dress. There is very little way that she could have hid that. The way All they right. designed it, she doesn't have petticoats. She doesn't have anything. It's just a dress. And my thought process is you could have gotten rid of all of my complaints about this random thing if uh -huh. you just had, when Selena gets into this fight and gets into this warehouse, just have one shot of her ripping it. Like, that's all I need, and I would have believed it. Like, oh, oh of course, she just, she just, she has it tied to her leg, but oh, she just rips her dress and pulls it out. Like, okay, cool. I would have bought that immediately. Like, like she's made it to be tearaway, basically. Yeah. Yeah, oh. like that I would believe in a second. It's the idea of yeah, you're just walking around everywhere with this dress that yeah. would not work in this era. And it, and it's one of those things, to me, it's like, okay, you know, people would be like, you guys are being super picky about this thing, right? <laughs> and I get it. I, I get where that's coming from. Yeah. I, I have a lot of respect for that. That's fine. And, and I get it. Um, but when I'm writing something, I want to dive this deep. I want to say like, how can I give this more like verisimilitude, how can I make this more interesting? Like, even if we showed, saw her in a scene where she's got like a dress and she's cutting it and then like putting, putting just one like whip stitch, you know, a few whip stitches into it, right? And then you're like, oh my gosh, wow, the level of detail in this movie is incredible. You know, like so it, it really kind of, these little scenes in the background that you can fold in can help draw your reader deeper into it and also give your reader or watcher more trust in you when something you you aren't going to compensate for <laughs> comes up because they're like, wow, okay, I'll give that a hand wave because, man, that whip stitch thing was rad, you know, or whatever, you know, it's something, something to keep in mind. But aside from all of that, I really do love the way that they costume Selena for this movie that they costume everyone. Like, I feel like everyone has really interesting designs in this film. Yeah. Like I love, I love the steampunk bat suit with like the yeah. multiple rows of buttons and everything. Right. Like it the just big leather pouches. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it looks so cool. And I love, I love Selena's look that they gave her something that was like, they could like, <laughs> as someone who did this whole, I, I just took a whole seminar on Victorian uh, literature this past semester and we talked a lot about costumes because we were doing Oscar Wilde who cared a lot about clothing and like there was stuff that they could have put Selena in from this era that would have fit in this era and would have been more sexualized especially because she was part of theater and part of right. kind of the underbelly of Gotham and they could have and they didn't and I appreciate that they didn't they're like no based on everything we know about Selena She'd be wearing something relatively practical most of the time. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I appreciate this so much. Yeah, and on, I mean on that same thing, like so, like the like the Batman costume, right? So he's got yeah. like the big leather pouches, and he's got the boots, you know, and he's just got that kind of stuff. He has like some of these sharpened, you know, batarang things that Selena pulls out at one point that she is going to use as proof. But he doesn't have like, and he could have. He doesn't have like you know the grapple gun projector you know and stuff like that but when the steampunk motorcycle comes out <laughs> i was like that's crazy and kind of cool like it yeah. goes it goes into the comic book logic of like how the heck does that work but can you imagine i can't i'm putting myself in the minds of the people on the street <laughs> who have i mean this is 1890s right there's like horseless carriages are not a thing right it's not like a thing and so you see like this this horseless motorized thing tearing through the streets i think that would be so no noisy number one like super <laughs> yeah. like horrifying like you could hear it from streets away going like oh god the batman's here you know what i mean you like can, and you can hear it in the film like they have like they have an extended shot that's just a street with noise in the background yeah and watching it i was like 
are they going to give us a steampunk motorcycle? And then Batman just turns around the corner and I scream. You're right. I was like, this is the coolest thing. Like, it was one of those things that I was, it was rule of cool. It's like, this is cool enough that I don't care that it doesn't make sense. Right, right. Yeah, it's so cool. And and perfectly works in with Batman, right? He's always supposed to have, you know, the next generation of technology, which is which is cool. But, you know, in this case, it's just got to be like add to the myth of who he is and also not so complicated that he couldn't build it himself. Yeah. Right. When you're talking about like the justice league having a secret satellite in orbit, (laughs) probably not building that in the bat cave, but like, you know, like the steampunk stuff and his costume and those kinds of stuff. You're like, yeah, you could totally make this and I would believe it and have it so that no one knew who you were, where you got these things from, which I think is cool. Same with this, with the uh, what we were saying about the suit. The other thing that I like is that they don't try to pretend that he'd have access to any sort of material that would be like bulletproof or anything. Right. Like he gets into a fight and walks out, and like the whole bat, <laughs> the bat symbol is just right, like just slashed up and torn. <laughs> right, right. Like I appreciate that you are not trying to make up Victorian era Kevlar or anything like that. Gordon like just stabs him right through an arm. <laughs> like yeah. at one point, it's just like, oh, dude, not. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of armor going on in that outfit. Nope. No. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. And he's and he bleeds. He bleeds in this movie. Yeah. yeah. Rated R. Rated R. You can bleed as much as we want. <laughs> so yeah. Do we have some notes from Neil that we'd like to share? Oh yeah, absolutely. Neil also uh cranked through and watched a bunch of the stuff and he noted some of the stuff that we did as well. Um, but then some extra stuff too, which is kind of cool we pointed out I hadn't mentioned, which is, you know, the Harvey Dent comment about Jekyll and Hyde and then I was like was that written and then I realized yeah it sure had yeah and Selena says it right and the the lion tamer like take on Selena was really really good and it, it made it made a good reason for the whip right and then her being an orphan and being on the streets and like all of this her whole background in here made so much sense and was so well done I love Selena in this, guys. I really love Catwoman Me too. in general, but I love Selena in this. I, I loved, well, we'll get back to Neil's thing in a second, but I loved, I loved, there were things that I was watching for, like, I when I when I described it as, like, Selena and Batman face off with Jack the Ripper and they both almost die. That happens, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, Selena's getting choked with her own whip and then Batman shows up to save her and then he gets the crap kicked out of him by Jack the Ripper and then she distracts Jack. I have then, lots of notes. Yeah, so good. Like, and, and then later on, too, like, okay, she's injected with laudanum. Great. All right, she's going to be unconscious and Batman's going to show up. Oh, wait, no, no. She, she fights it off for a long time. Yes. She's got her own agency. Even when she passes out, or not passes out, even when she's like almost incapacitated in there where she realized there's nowhere she can run. She can't fight this guy. And she's just kind of given in to the laudanum. And then Batman shows up. Then the fire starts. And, and then she's like, okay, she just rallies herself. And yeah. I, I think I saw somewhere online, somebody was like, well, wait a minute. Just a minute ago, she was half incapacitated. And I'm like, there's a psychology to these things. Yeah. And, the, and the psychology to the situation is she's like, I, I can't win. Right, so I can't, I can't drive myself to stand up because all he's going to do is punch me down again. So I can't, I have to just lay here. But then once there's a fire and there's an opening and it's moving and she's get like, I can see her going like, okay, I got a way out now. I have a way. I can dig deep and do this, make this happen. And the fact that she drags Bruce out as well, like everything is, I think, handled so well. The female character has full agency in the story. And can can be a a parallel to Batman and Bruce in the story without either one of them having anything taken away. I got I got lots of notes on her and lots of notes on them. But if we want, and we can go into that, or we can keep going with Neil's stuff. <laughs> well, let me go. Let me go into. Uh, let me go into a few things. Neil said, "No one steals from Alfred." <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. I, Alfred also having agency and and not uh, not fallen prey. I'm I'm a little disappointed they didn't have Jason actually stealing the wheels off of the wagon, but you know, I it, wanted it. I, you t- wanted I know, it so right? Bad. Yeah, it would have been completely dumb. Like it wouldn't have made any sense whatsoever, and would have been. I would have like, laughed. Yeah, I would have but... laughed my head off. It would have been really funny. Um, the bat wagon. I don't know what you'd call that. <laughs> yeah, I got her. I got her. No, I'm fine. No, I think there was a spit take in there. I got her. I tried to time that with a tea drink. 
But Neil also pointed out a few things. He said he has a few issues with the chase scene. And I've got, we'll, we'll, we'll get into some issues, but we're going to, our issues, but I'm going to mention some of, of Neil's, which I think were pretty valid. He said, wouldn't the guards have seen two people? <laughs> like, they look out, they pull the alarm, and you see Jack, and you see Batman, and Batman's chasing Jack. Like, it's pretty clear the way that it was edited, that the guards at the asylum would have seen that there was more than one person there. Um, his other comment is like, why are there cages heavy enough that can break bridges hanging over the bridges? Because and why are there bridges? Aesthetic. Why are there bridges in it? They're just hanging people around. They're like, we don't have any space. Let's hang it in this hallway. Like, because I don't, aesthetic. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like that's that's the only reason for that right, one. It's right, like, what right. a look cool in our Victorian asylum. Our Victorian even asylum, if it doesn't right. make sense. No sense and torture. Yeah. Why is there? Why was there a police airship just hanging out by the asylum? That's a good question. There's a lot of crime. There. There's, there's he, he pulls the, when Jack walks into Hugo's office. Hugo's has all these masks on the wall. One of the things I was thinking that seemed like a missed opportunity was not having all of these random masks, basically the masks of Batman villains, <laughs> which would have been interesting. I I think they tried with a few, but I'm like, oh man, it would have been so interesting if you could be like, oh look, that's Joker's face. Oh, look, that's, you know, Penguin, you know, like, because they have enough stylization. But anyway, Jack the Ripper, I, a.k.a. Um, Gordon, pulls this mask, random mask that has no strap. It's got no hook. It's got no nothing. And he just puts it on his face to terrify Hugo. And then he wears it. And like Batman punches him in the face like four <laughs> times. And he falls off like an airship and rolls off a rooftop. And it's just like. And Neil's like, how did that random mask stay on? And I'm like, that's a really good question. Also, why didn't it break when Batman <laughs> punched it in the face? I mean, what was this made out of? I don't know. Magic. It's made magic, magic on all accounts. <laughs> nice. Uh, how did the cops not see two people chasing each other? I no guess idea. that airship was made out, was filled with hydrogen. I don't know. It blew up and started on fire. And he's like, he's like, a few bullets took that thing down, but crashing into buildings didn't stop it. Yeah, man, we'll see about that. I mean, he hit, they hit the engine. The engine hit fire, caught fire, caught fire to the thing. I don't know. I'm not sure about how that goes. He's all, I love the ease by which Bruce escapes being locked up in Blackgate. He's like, yeah, I got to get out. I'm going to pick a, pick a fight with Solomon Grundy, take a guard out, I'm done. <laughs> this is not this is not the 21st century. <laughs> I I find it hilarious though that his way of disguising himself as a guard is that he just uses a cockney accent. <laughs> like right. he puts on the costume and is like, "How will these people not know I'm Bruce Wayne? I'll just do a bad British accent." <laughs> it's not that bad. It's honestly not that bad. It's just so thick. And it's like, a bloody it's Donnie Brook in there or whatever he says. <laughs> it's apparently apparently all guards just have like really heavy accents in this. and as much as i love this trope of putting on the guards costumes and getting out it just it almost makes no sense <laughs> yeah because these guards how many of them are there 10 <laughs> you know who's on shift that night you've been working with these people your whole life somebody comes out and starts yelling orders at you you'd be like who are you i'm on a smoke break <laughs> like i just can't, right i just don't see that happening I mean, there are other things, too, like, I mean, like, people walking through a hospital, right? Like, a 10, 11-story hospital like I worked in. There's a lot of people there, you know, and, and the, you know, there's that old trope of, like, walk around with a clipboard and, like, you know what you're <laughs> doing and people don't, don't ask you a question. And that, to some extent, that's true because there's just too many people, right? But, like, these, I mean, it's Arkham Asylum, like, how many guards could there have been that they didn't know? Oh, not Arkham Asylum. Sorry, it's uh, was it Blackgate? Yeah, I think it was. It was prison. I don't remember if they give it a name. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't remember if it was Blackgate or what's the but other yeah, one? There the other one that was in um, Young Justice. Bell Rev. Bell Rev. Yeah, I think it was. I, I think, think it was Blackgate. Be, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it would be Bell Rev. No, it wouldn't have been. But I mean, they still couldn't. I don't know. It just seemed funny to me. So I agree with Neil on all those fronts. Yeah, yeah. I I wrote it off during the film just because I'm like, this is cool. I'll accept it. <laughs> right. But like, yeah, it has flaws. Right. It's one of those scenes where the second you look at it for too long, yeah, it's like, well, none of that made sense. I really, I, I'm cool. with Neil. I had to hand wave like, how many times are you going to punch him in the face with this mask on and it's not going to fly off? 
Like it just does. It just seems so weird. Like is it burned onto his face? Like I don't understand why. And then I, I mean, I had a couple of other things too. Like yeah, I have I have my one main problem too. Okay, do you want to do yours? No, you can go. It's fine. I was just saying. I was like, I also have yeah. have a thing to contribute. <sighs> the thing that I would want to see tightened up in a in a redraft of this is more hints that it was Gordon. Yeah, I agree. Like this this doesn't fully work as a mystery. It doesn't. The audience can't figure it out. Right. Because in rewatching it again, if you compare the animation of the burns on Barbara Gordon's face with the animation from earlier on, they're not there. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, I it's was, too I wasn't it's sure too extreme. Yeah, no, the later scene they they wanted to make it look really horrifying, which I get, but like you could see both sides of her face. It wasn't that hidden. Like, if I remember correctly, you could see both ears even in the earlier scenes. So there was none of that. There was no, there was no like odd dialogue that Gordon says to her or says to Batman that could have been taken out of con, that, that would have been perfectly fine. But then when you knew what was happening, go back and rewatch. This happens yeah. in Young Justice all the time. People say stuff and you're like, like when McGann is talking to Artemis and Artemis says something about like, I've always wanted a sister. I have 13 back on Mars, but it's not the same. And Artemis says, I wouldn't know. Yeah. And the second time you watch it through, you realize that Cheshire's her sister and that line has an entirely Perfect. different meaning, right? Yeah. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of that. Also, I have n- still have no clue why Gordon was helping Batman. Why did he hand him... The letter, the the um, dear boss letter, which is a which is a which is a Jack the Ripper letter, by the way. That's a real he wanted, what he was reading was actually written by Jack the Ripper, or at least it's attributed to him. But I don't know why he would do that, and I don't know why he would say some of the things he'd said because he was talking about Jack the Ripper as a psychopath, which means he was telling he was talking about himself as a psychopath, and so but it doesn't quite fit with the pathophysiology of what the what he was doing what he said later in the movie yeah it's like the only thing that i can think to write off that bit is like he's saying what he thinks he needs to say to draw suspicion off of him but that doesn't make any sense either because then why is he working with batman in the first place is the real question right and then and and the 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 kind of the pathology that he's got going on right now in this movie is like i'm right everyone else is wrong forget you all And so why would he be referring to himself and his own actions as terrible and horrible and against the city? Like he doesn't, I'm not quoting him, but like there's definitely lines where I'm like, that might have been written a little more subtly so that on a rewatch you realize he's actually saying something else. Do you know what I mean? But that didn't happen. There was too many direct lines with him being, wanting to catch Jack the Ripper and being on it, you know, and I would have liked to be a little more subtle. So my two points on this The only thing I can really think now as I'm trying to think about it is there could be some argument made for that he's working with Batman so that he can frame Batman for this, that he's trying to like gain his trust so that he can then like make sure that where Batman is so that Batman doesn't have an alibi and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that 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 would have been that would have popped into my head. I think like if you and I were in the writer's room, we would have bantered that idea back and forth probably. Yeah. Right. It's just you got to make that a little more clear. But he, but he, it doesn't. It, it's not clear in here, and it doesn't. And none of that actually happens. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then, yet they had the detail of doing things like, so the note that he hands to the guard, the note to the guard, and he says, "If you get this in thirty minutes to Wayne Manor, Alfred will give you two hundred dollars." Right. Yeah. And the that note, that, you, yeah. the note was a bunch of stick figure people. That's a direct nod to The Dancing Men, The Mystery of the Dancing Men, Sherlock Holmes short story. So I'm, I, I'm, he opens it up and I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh my, that's Dancing Men. And I was like, oh yeah, he just made a reference to Holmes. So he must have talked to Holmes after The Dancing Men and gotten that, missed, gotten that code that he uses with Alfred, which I think is great and is like crazy detail, right? Yeah, yeah. But the twist with Gordon just didn't, some of it was really interesting and good. Like the idea was good. I just think the yeah. the seed planting needed to be just a little bit different to make it as tight as I would like it. I agree. And going back to um, the whole situation with Barbara and how they were trying to do the thing with the scarring, 
as you're saying, like, it's an interesting idea and it looks horrifying in that scene and it should. But like the earlier scene where we see her, one of the easiest things that they could have done. And I can't remember if they did this now because I'm thinking back and it's been a couple of days since I've seen this. She is at home during that scene. They are at home in the morning. No one else in the house is up. I'm pretty sure she's even wearing a robe. They could have just had her have her hair down and had it cover half of her face. Yeah. Because if it is, if she is at home during this era, her hair being down is no big deal. Yes. Like, you could have done that and I would have just got, shrugged it off and kept going. And they could have done that. They could have played with the lighting and the shadows since that room isn't very well lit. But they don't really do either of those as far as I remember. When those would have been two very simple, easy... Right. ways in the scene to hide that the other problem with that scene is that it's all also based around gordon waking up from a nightmare about losing barbara yep. and then like going and being really like sweet and genuine and seeming like a really good husband and i'm like this doesn't fit with anything we find out later about you at all <laughs> right and now they kind of put a lampshade on that because later on she says but not with us he's gentle as a lamb with us and I'm like, okay, he's not. I, I, yeah, except for the part where he, yeah burns the sin out of you. But like that, yeah. So there's some, and and I was just thinking of another way to like make some of that work. It gets into tropey areas though. But like instead of having him know and understand fully that he's what he's doing and just basically either pretending like being a copycat of Jack or Jack the Ripper or actually being Jack the Ripper. You know, that kind of thing. Like, I don't... They could have had a thing where he was psychologically broken. So basically a two-faced type of a thing. Yeah. Like, he's right-handed because the nuns beat it out of him, but when he's doing Jack's work, he uses his left hand because that's what he was born, being left-handed. You know, that kind of stuff makes sense. Like, they make that reference, and they could have done more with that. (laughs) Right. And that way, it would have been a little bit more of an excuse to have some of his lines be like, have him be like a good man who broke it during the hellacious civil war, which I totally buy, right? Surgeons in the civil war, I don't know how they maintain their sanity. So I, I, I get that. But it's just something that just needed to be a little bit more tightened if they had had time. But it, it wasn't too much to where I couldn't just hand wave some of it, but I was like, oh, I wish that would have been a little bit more of a hint. Like I want, I, I like when I, they plant the seeds and I don't notice them. And then I go back and rewatch them, right? It's the, it's the Hello, Megan theme playing on a TV, sh- TV set in the background kind of stuff that I, want, that I want from a mystery like this. Especially if you're going to change it so drastically from the original comic, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So with all of that set aside, and I find it hilarious that we're like, we really liked this movie. Yeah. Here are all of the problems. Well, and, and I don't think there, there are pr- problems, but I, but you know, like we, I mean, we try to do this on the, the regular show too, right? Yeah. So yeah. we're looking at it and we're going like, I liked it. It doesn't mean it, that means it doesn't mean it's perfect. I don't like things because yeah. they're perfect. I like them because I enjoy the emotional ride something somebody takes me on. I think it's okay to look at it and go like, yeah, but you know what could have made it even better is if they'd have tweaked this, that, and this. And maybe if I'm doing something later on or I'm helping somebody, you know, in a break a script, you know, uh, for them before they move on to the next step, what am I looking at? And what makes sense to me and how do I feel like you could dive a little deeper pretty easily, like with just like an extra line or tweaking a tone, you know what I mean? Like stuff that doesn't add like entire scenes of script or something. So for me, my problem that I noted while watching it and just kind of frustrated me on a level of how obvious it was, was how this film deals with planting and payoff for two specific things, being that. (laughs) when they have the world's fair scene at the beginning when they're setting up like the world's fair they literally they're like here is a giant spotlight here is a giant ferris wheel and i literally wrote down immediately oh that's the bat signal and we're having the climactic fight at the end on that ferris wheel yeah cool and those aren't bad narrative elements, but they're just so obvious that I was literally able to predict the climax of the film an hour in advance, and that's not great. I can see how that could be a thing. For me, and the, the I mean, the Ferris wheel was blatant for sure. I I argue with none of that point. The 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 bat signal though, for me, it wasn't that. Oh, it's the bat signal. Part of me was like, all right, how are they going to get to that? That's interesting. 
Right. And it was it was interesting. I mean, <laughs> Selena's literally using her own blood or something to wipe like a really gothic looking, you know, smear of a bat on it. And turn. I'm like, wow, that's a that's a messed up inspiration for the bat signal from here on in. Yeah. You know, like that, like their execution of the bat signal is is very interesting. And like, I completely agree with that. It was just the fact that the second they like panned over and was like, Here's this giant lamp. Right. I'm like, no, I hear you. Well, I totally you're hear either you. setting up for like a post credit scene of Batman later, or you're setting right. up for at some point in this, that's going to be a bat signal. I don't know <laughs> how or why, but it will be. It's, and che- it's like Chekhov's floodlight. <laughs> literally. Right. Like the fact that they, it's the fact that they take the time. Like if they'd shown up at the fairgrounds and the Ferris wheel had just been in the background, I feel like that would have worked just as well. If, like, that, like, they didn't need to, like, slow down the scene to tell me, this is a Ferris wheel. This is how fast it goes. Yes, you can go on the Ferris wheel. Here's a joke about how Victorian scientists don't understand the human body yet, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, you're spending so much time on this Ferris wheel. You are telegraphing for me that we are going to be on this Ferris wheel when you could have just shown it instead of taking the time to tell me anything about this ferris wheel right but the ferris wheel joke's good though the ferris wheel joke is pretty funny (laughs) like i'm able to like let it go because i'm like okay that joke was really funny (laughs) like you could have you like narratively you could have used your ferris wheel better but you wrote a funny joke so i'm conflicted (laughs) right yeah and it's like either if they'd just not taken the time on those elements as much or if they'd maybe referenced some other things around the World's Fair, like if it had, those had both been like part of a list of like other things, maybe it wouldn't have been as obvious. It's just the fact that they walk in and the only two things they tell us about are here is a light, here is a Ferris wheel and nothing else here matters. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, the other thing that I had too, which I actually forgot about, actually there's one a Neil thing and then the thing that I had. The one Neil, the, the one thing that I had was, the other thing that I would have liked to have seen tightened is Bruce is talking to Selena and he realizes that they were all, they, they both know Leslie Tompkins and that a lot of these, you know, the, the, the women that were murdered were, you know, they were also part of that, but not all of them, you know. That kind of thing. And then suddenly he's like, why am I so such an idiot? And he runs out and runs to Leslie Tompkins. And I'm like, why now? Like, why why do you have to rush over there now? And why is now the time that Jack is going to kill her? Why didn't he kill her like a week ago? Like, I don't understand why that night was a big deal. I'm trying to think back and remember if there was a reason. Because I felt like... Because it it works in the narrative because it just does like it just everything like it's a narrative and you're willing to let things line up. But to me, at least on some level, it didn't feel like Bruce was running to stop a murder that he thought was imminent. I feel like you could chalk it up to like Bruce ran to go warn her of like you're on his list. And it just happened that the same night that Bruce realizes this is also the same night that it happens. There could be some level of coincidence. Yeah. That but... level of coincidence is hard to swallow. And on top yeah, of that, I on top of that, they gave Leslie agency by saying, well, this is how it ends. Huh? Like she knew it was coming. Like she just, she kind of knew like, you're like, yeah, you're a smart woman. Right. And you knew this already. So even if Bruce had warned her ahead of time, she'd be like, why are you an idiot? Yes. <laughs> This is, yeah, probably. Why are you an idiot? (laughs) Probably. You know, like, and and I get that. That's great. So, but it was just this strange, like, could it have happened? Sure. Do I believe it? I I wanted a, I wanted something to set up, like something from a letter or something from something like that dropped a hint about like who he was going to be going after next. You know what I mean? Like that's so subtle that he only he could put it together with the information that they had. But we didn't get any of that. He just runs out and get me a handsome immediately and like breaks in. Like doesn't even like knock on the door or like ring a bell. He just jumps in there and runs in there. So like, yeah, it was just it was just a, another thing that I think it was it was an interesting scene and it moved the mo- it moved it forward, but I just wanted I wanted more setup. And I really appreciate in in that scene, though, even though 
it does have flaws. I appreciate that Leslie has so much agency in that scene because that scene easily could have been an example of like, we're killing Leslie to make Batman upset, but it's just that she is genuinely part of this narrative. It has nothing to do with Batman and like his arc. It's just that she is connected to this mystery and she is connected to these other victims. And they give her the moment of like her saying, I'm not going to beg. I am not going to try and... I'm not like, giving you the satisfaction. Yeah. And, like, I, and I forgive like, you. Oof. Yeah. Wow. Like those couple of lines, I'm like, you yeah. are the nice. strongest individual right. ever. And I like it. I can feel invested in this scene without rolling my eyes at what the narrative is doing right. to you. I And, and this episode we're recording... Uh, the day our first comic commentary for the finale airs, and we go into detail talking about the concept of fridging. This is how you n- don't fridge someone. Yeah. <laughs> you give you give her agency. You give her choice. You give you you give her strength and power in the scene. Does her death motivate Bruce? Absolutely. Of course it does. Like it it it, it hurts him and moves him forward to realize he needs to do something. Stuff like that. That's gr- that's fine. Just don't either create a woman that we don't care about or know and then just murder her for a reason, which sounds which is just awful. Or take a really strong character, or a character who could be really strong, and take all their agency away and then torture them when you're like, wait, why isn't she just taking care of business by herself? Like, you know what I mean? Like this is this is how you do that. Yeah. Because it's also not the villain being like, I'm killing you to hurt Batman. It's I'm killing you because I need you out of the way. It is about her. Right. And in his mind, it's like, I need you to stop bringing these people in here. Right. Because Bullock says at the beginning, which almost points the finger at Bullock, by the way, at the beginning where he's like, it's your fault. It's your fault. All of these, you know, derelicts and, and, you know, that kind of thing are in this city causing these problems in the first place. So, yeah, I like it. One more thing that Neil had that I want to point out that it's, just, it's not a major thing, but I think again it's this kind of cool detail is the idea that um, the Robins, the Cock Robins, had um, I, love I know had uh, they were using the weapons they're basically like known for in the comics at the beginning. Like Jason's got a knife, and I think uh, Tim's got like a pool cue quote staff kind of thing, which I thought was kind of cool, right? And then they get you know Batman disarms them. Uh, I hadn't noticed that until I saw it in Neil's notes. That was really cool. And I like that they're the right ages, kind of. Like, they're not all the same age. Like, Dick Grayson's older than the other two. It's cute. It's Dick and then Jason and then Tim. Yeah, it's really good. It could be really good. And I always love the kind of... Speaking of Sherlock Holmes, uh, I'm always a big fan of the the Baker Street Irregulars, which are the, the kids, the street urchins and kids that that Holmes like pays to go do stuff for him because nobody pays attention to kids. And I'm like, that's really cool. It sucks that these orphans are on the street. Like that's just horrible. (laughs) But like this idea is really interesting and how they kind of folded and paralleled that in with um, the Robin characters, I think is actually really cool. And having all, all three Robins together at the same time. That's cool. (laughs) Yeah. Catwoman also has a similar thing in uh, some of her volumes when she gets to be more of a hero than a villain of just kind of, has a small gang of kids that she like looks after and if they hear about stuff happening they like just come and tell selena and she's like thanks i'm gonna go fight some people now you're right and speaking of cow i was gonna say we should get on to the reason why you (laughs) wanted to do this one in the first place (laughs) yeah (laughs) yup we're sorry that it's taken so long to hit here, folks, but I I voted for Gotham by Gaslight because yay, Selena in a movie. I love her so much. Catwoman. She's so good. Is this. my fave. She's so they good. They handled her so, part of that is so happy. That right, this right here, this film is just a steampunk flavored version of my favorite interpretation of Catwoman as a character, which is summed up perfectly by during that scene in the Dionysus Club, Bruce calls selena a champion for the voiceless as like how she sees herself and how she acts and that's always been my favorite ideology to give catwoman of like why she does what she does she does things outside the law she does but they're always in pursuit of like helping those that go largely overlooked by the good guys because it's like oh they're eh. It's complicated that's morally gray we can't get into that she's like they deserve to live too and that's 
largely what she's doing in this film. Like that first scene that we see of her being bait for Jack the Ripper is her being like, nobody else is trying to save these women. I'm going to go do it myself. Bye. Yep. And I love it. And this film does a great job of portraying that in a setting that makes sense. And I also find it really interesting that they decided instead of making Selena a thief, which they could have done, thieves existed in this time too. They could have done that as her backstory. They make her an actress and they make her a theater owner, which I think works great and I love it. And narratively, it allows her to be just one step removed from the women being murdered. Like it shows how close she is to all of this and how easily she could end up as just one of these victims in the same way, since this is at the s- <laughs> in an era when being an actress, especially an actress, not just acting, but being a female actor, was seen as just heavily associated with the same kinds of jobs that these women were having that were getting them murdered in the street by Jack the Ripper. Uh, and it also places her in line with more of the underbelly of Gotham, because even though like the rich society folks are going and watching her shows, the people in these shows <laughs> were never quite that rich. But I I love all of that, that it works so well narratively and gives her so much agency and power at the same time. Like there's just a casual line where she's like, I own the whole theater. I'm like, of course you do. I love it. <laughs> I, I love there was a bit where she was saying like, here, I brought these clothes. I had these clothes brought yeah. up for you. And I was like, I, I thought they were going to go just a couple things real quick. I thought they were going to go with a, an Irene Adler thing with her, which was kind of cool. <laughs> And for those of you, they do a bit. They do a little bit, right? So, like Irene Adler, for those of you who don't know who she is, Irene Adler is uh, an opponent. For those of you who haven't seen the Sherlock Holmes TV series, I guess she only appears in one Sherlock Holmes story, and he constantly refers to her as the woman, as in she is the personification of how brilliant women can be, kind of a thing. And she is that she's an actress. She's a master of disguise. She's absolutely genius. Um, she actually beats him, basically. It's really great. So they kind of folded that in. And on a similar note, I just realized where Diogenes came from. <laughs> when I said Diogenes Club, yeah. I was like, I thought that was a thing. It is a thing. <laughs> it's a thing in Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> of course. Uh, Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's brother, uh, is a member of a place called the Diogenes Club, which was a men's club in London. So that's probably some parallel there too. I was like, why is Diogenes so prominent in my head? But that's what it was. I just looked it up and I was like, oh, of course, of course that makes sense. And speak, speaking of the club, to get to my last point, so we can try to wrap this up. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> have a lot of, we have a lot of feelings about this film, apparently. <laughs> I, I, it never comes up on the main show because Catwoman isn't on Young Justice, but I love Batman and Catwoman mm-hmm. so much, guys. They're like my cornerstone DC comics ship. I love them so much. And I think that this narrative does a fantastic job of portraying their relationship in a way that I can really get behind. Because there are some portrayals of them where I'm like, no, that's not their relationship. You're doing it wrong. It's so classic in comics. And it's it's there's so few storylines where I can point at and go like, oh, this is a... This is a classic. Like this, this is a representative of the thing I have in my head. Yes. Almost none like of them. of my my emotional understanding of this relationship. This is a good example of it. A steampunk version of it. Right. But and it's a couple of things. So like many super sweethearts here, people. Real quick. Uh, part of it is that the narrative presents them as equals immediately, and like that is important for this because part of it is we talked about there's the scene where they both almost die but in that scene they both repeatedly save each other it is not just selena kyle gets attacked batman comes in and helps it's that once he gets incapacitated she gets up and like attacks the jack the ripper again and they go back and forth with who is helping who and even in that final scene with the fire she is half drugged and almost unconscious and she still takes the time to like drag Bruce away from dying in a fire. Right. While she's half drugged. Yes, yes. After he has just saved her by getting uh, James away from her. Right. Like, they go back and forth, and that puts them both on the same level. And at the same time, 
they also have the fact that they're both incredibly smart and they're both incredibly observant because they have that scene in the Dionysus Club where she points out, she's like, you're studying me. And he just kind of like hands her her whole backstory that he's figured out. Yeah. And then they have a scene later in her apartment where she's like, I should have figured out you were Batman sooner. Here's all the stuff I picked up on. I just needed the last clue right. and I figured it out. And she like, he doesn't even so have to good. tell her why she's, why he's Batman. Yep. She knows. Yeah. She's she like, goes, oh, your Does parents. Batman have a story? He looks at her. Right. And she goes, oh, right. Your parents. I understand you completely. And I'm like, I love it. Right. Totally up to speed. Uh, just needed that. I got it. I got it. This all makes, everything makes sense. I love, I love the thing she said was, is when you kissed my hand, I felt like he has the calluses of a trapeze artist, right? Not just calloused hands, like a very specific kind of calloused hands, which tells you that he was in a circus. And then he comes back at her with the, yeah, I saw this acrobatic circus dismount and the, and the whip that told me that you were, because I've been in a freaking circus as well. (laughs) Like, like. It's just so good. Like ugh. it's so good. Yeah. And per- and one of the things that I love that they do with this that so many Batcat storylines that people rewriting Batcat do and I hate it is that Selina isn't just chasing after a seemingly uninterested Bruce. Yes. Like yes. so many storylines are like Catwoman's in love with him but he's too focused on work and I'm like no, that's dumb. Stop it. Never again. And it shouldn't happen. And what they do with this is that they both just genuinely fall for each other. Like, they both have other things they're working on. Batman is still being Batman. He just at the same time meets Selina and is like, maybe I do have time for one individual. Whoops, she's really cool. And I like that they're allowed to do that. And I I think it calls back to what you said at the beginning about this idea that he's I mean, they they set it up right at the beginning that he's a much more caring. He's not he's not on the streets because he's angry and full of vengeance. He's on he, like she says. She says like, are are you making them pay? And he said, I, that's how it started out. But I can never make them pay enough. And and but the look on his face, it wasn't like Punisher. I could never make them pay enough. You know, like yeah. it wasn't like that. It was more like he was like, I was a child. Like I was childish and now I'm doing it for entirely different reasons because I love and care about the city and the people in it and I'm trying to do good. And and you see it when he interacts with, tells the kid, tells the, the, the Robins that they do a good job. You see it in his relationship with Alfred. You see it in his relationship with Catwoman. You see it in his relationship with Leslie. Like you see it in everything. You even see it when he tries to save James. Yeah. He's like just just come along and we can move on and we can, he just wants to help people right which is the best batman and she calls him on it too she's like you wouldn't do that so many men would have left harvey behind hours ago he's like you don't know me like it's great banter and it's beautiful but you could it's just she's so she's on it and i love it yeah and with that they have great chemistry in this movie cuz part of it so it's good. not just like all of the good narrative beats they have great chemistry and that's partially the writing and it's partially the actors and it's great because i am a sucker for flirty sparring bat cat banter and i am also a sucker for sweet emotional like understanding each other as people bat cat Mm -hmm. and this movie gives us both like within 10 minutes of each other and i love it it's so much fun and the thing that shouldn't surprise me that does is that there are actually scenes that are both of them like just getting to know each other right. and actually like being invested in a conversation which shouldn't be shocking but like yeah. they walk out of her dressing room and they're just having a conversation about recent events and like their thought processes on them and I'm like and Harvey's like bored the whole time right <laughs> and they're just and it's that scene makes me laugh because they are just so completely into each other that they literally forget he's there. Right. Like the animation just shows them like moving closer to each other and just leaving him like in the background. Mm-hmm. And I love it. I love everything that they do with their relationship. And I love that they get a mostly happy ending at the end of this film. Like so many bat cat narratives in film are like, and they really care about each other, but they can't be together because reasons. Yeah. And this, they just, they're sitting in the carriage holding hands as they walk away from the world burning. And I'm like, that's as happy as I can ask for right now. And I'm okay with it. And I, w- I would love to have another movie that's not part of the comics as a sequel based on this thing yes. where they are 
dis- they disagree about how maybe to get certain things done possibly, but yeah. they're actually like partners. Yes. That yes. would be great. Like, and, and not partners like destined to be torn apart. No, they're partners no. and they just disagree with how things, she grew up very differently than he did. So yeah. she has a, ve- she, she took the, the bullets out of her dad's gun <laughs> and let a lion eat him. Like, yeah. very different situation behind her parents' death than his, you think? I love how that's so casually implied. Right. She just goes, someone, someone took, took the, the bullets, bullets out of his, out of his gun. gun. I'm like, Selena, did you murder your yeah. dad? Well, it, and you know what? You did. Bruce is like, yeah, that tracks. Yeah. Right? That like, <laughs> and he's not mad. No, he holds he's just, he's, look out right, the he's just like, not sure I can blame you much for that. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like... Guess what? He was probably beating a lion, and the lion ate him because the guy was an abusive idiot. Okay, I he basically made his own bed. So, uh, yeah, I could I would love to see that that dynamic. And I'm really impressed by um, the actress for Catwoman. I have to say, I loved Dexter. She was not my favorite character. I don't know if she was being directed weirdly or that kind of thing. I've seen her in other things, and she's quite good. And she was brilliant in this. She had so much behind that voice. She's so good. I hope she gets more and more voice acting roles. She's great. I agree. She's great in this. And I agree. I would love I would love a sequel set in this world. I want the whole alternate universe part of the of the DC movie canon that's just Gotham by Gaslight and them going on adventures with the whole Bat family that they just kind of amass at the end right. of the film. <laughs> All right, well, I think we should probably get into uh, the uh, the once in future past here and wrap this up. Yes. See, I know stuff only a future boy would know. Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, Garfield Logan. Your name's Tim, and yours is Dick? Oops, spoilers. This secret identity thing is so retro. All right, so in the once in future past, we're reviewing how the movie kind of differed a little bit or, or didn't from the comics that inspired it. Gotham by Gaslight was originally published in 1989, February of 1989, uh, it was a one-shot at the time. It was written by Brian Augustine. The artist is Mike Mignola from Hellboy fame. The inker was P. Craig Russell, and the editor was Mark Wade, who was working at DC at the time. It was also notable for being the first, although it's not credited on the cover, at least it wasn't when it came out, the first Elseworlds, which is where we get the title of our show from, or this segment from. Uh, Elseworlds became a basically DC's answer to Marvel's what if, and they would take characters and they would put them in different situations or tweak some aspects of their history. Like for example, what if Superman had landed in Russia instead of Kansas, right? Landed in a farm in Russia instead of Kansas and you get red sun, which was brilliant, really interesting, had a really cool twist at the end where the reason Lex Luthor is his arch enemy is because Lex Luthor is a genius scientist working for the United States, <laughs> I have one that's uh, what if Catwoman was the equivalent of Batman and Batman was the equivalent of Catwoman. Oh, nice. That's great. There's some really interesting stories. Even the, the basic premise of what if Batman was in the Wild West? What if Batman <laughs> was in the future? What if Batman, yeah. like Batman Red Rain, what if Batman fought Dracula and beat Dracula, but not before he got turned into a vampire himself? And then had a sequel where he, Batman's literally a vampire. Like, there's all of these crazy stories that you can tell that just proves how malleable these myths are, which is fantastic. Um, there was also, it wasn't, I don't think it was a follow-up to Gotham by Gaslight, but it was, I think it was called The Horror That Came to Gotham. And it was this really interesting kind of same kind of 1920s, maybe a few decades later setting, where basically it was Batman when like a thing they have unearthed in the Arctic ends up in Gotham city and it's basically Cthulhu, some Cthulhu (laughs) horror. I was waiting. I was, yeah, of course it was. Yeah. Yeah. Just really interesting takes. I like that. Right. And this one is steampunk Batman. Yeah. Steampunk Batman. They had all kinds of crazy. And then they did it with not just Batman and Superman, but they did it with everyone. Right. So they, they did it with Wonder Woman. They did it with Green Lantern and Flash. They had all these different Elseworlds stories were really great. So this was the first one. It was so popular at the time that they were like, oh, we got more ideas. Let's just do a thing like Vertigo, you know, title. And we'll just say like, put you know, just say what it is on the cover. that This is not like, you know, this didn't actually happen in the regular canon storyline. This is just a, a one shot and, you know, an exploration, which had some really cool stuff in it. So... The original comic had two stories in it, 
And those two stories, uh, basically, this is kind of a merging of those two stories, along with a lot of Catwoman stuff that they pull in, because I don't think she's in either of those stories, if I remember correctly. And so it pulls in the stuff that you were talking about, like from some of the kind of the classic best tropes of, of Catwoman and handles them very nicely. I have that written down. It actually pulls directly from a Catwoman arc. It does. Which one does it? Do, do you remember the arc or do you tell, tell us about it? What I wrote down is that the Catwoman series from the early 2000s, which is like my, my favorite Catwoman series, uh, actually started with the plot line of Selena putting the costume back on and returning to being Catwoman to hunt down someone in the East End who had been killing prostitutes. Oh, um, nice. Was just like his thing. And the GCPD would not investigate because they just didn't care it just didn't matter in the grand scheme of things to them so she was like cool i'll go back to being catwoman i'll go back to helping people and i'll protect the east end and all of the people who are being overlooked which is how i think where they got a lot of the stuff that feeds into her plot line in this movie yeah brilliant a brilliant like folding in of like what do we when you're when you're writing a story like this you're looking at it and you could you could do a direct translation right you know you could do it you could do a you know a uh, 300 style, we're going to take a comic, we're going to put it on a movie screen. Okay, yeah, that's a, a way to do it. But I think that you're, uh, when you're when you're doing an adaptation like this, you want to see what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are the through lines? If we change X, how do we compensate for Y and Z that happens later, right? And how do we subvert expectations of the watchers? How do we get the feel of it on the screen? And we can change it however we want. But how do we get the feel on the screen to make it work? And one of the things that was interesting to me that I didn't actually put the pieces together until we were reading, uh, talking earlier today, was that in the Jack the Ripper story that's in the comic, the Ripper turns out to be Bruce's dad's friend. So he calls him his uncle, Uncle Jake, who's a solicitor. And Jake doesn't show up in this story. And the reason why he became Jack the Ripper in the comic was because he was friends with Thomas. They were friends. They were medical friends during the war. The Jake had fallen, also fallen in love with Martha Wayne. He, you know, told her how he felt. She rebuffed him. He broke from the war and got crazy and just had her laughing in his head all the time and blah, blah, blah. He was the one who hired the Joe Chill, you know, analog to kill Martha and Thomas Wayne. Because he wanted the voices to stop, right? He wanted the laughing to stop, and okay, it's 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 kind of how it works, right? But so he he was he went to medical school. Thomas tried to help him go to medical school. He didn't. He flunked out of medical school, but then he he needed to do something. So Thomas helped him go to law school. So he became a solicitor. And in the scenes that we have in this story with Harvey Dent protecting him, is actually Jack's story. So Harvey's dating Harvey's dating Catwoman, and she rebuffs him for Bruce, and you get him like in Bruce's face, and then tells him you should you're going to find Bruce in Selena's apartment, and then he goes basically prosecutes his old best friend, and you know you I mean and she says the Jekyll and Hyde thing. So like if I had read the comic more recently as I was watching it, I would probably have been led to the idea that it was Harvey. Yeah, and that's great. Right. You also get Bullock at the beginning talking about how it's your fault, blah, blah, blah. There are definitely some hints here that they put in that weren't in the comic that were interesting to me that could have had fans of the comic wondering what's happening, but enjoying the feel that was being put on the screen. Yeah. Um, which I think is is really is pretty key. Right. I agree. Yeah. So um, there's a second story in it that takes place, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit farther in the future after he's, quote unquote, retired a bit. And uh, I don't remember the exact thing about the story of the storyline, but definitely like Commissioner Tolliver had become Mayor Tolliver, which is who he is in the in the the movie. There was a World's Fair and, the, you know, that kind of stuff and the final fight scenes and the World's Fair. And so they took they took those things and they kind of mashed and folded them together. And then we're like, hey, we need it. We need a strong female lead. And how can we take if we're going to do that? How do we make it the best it can be and put it all together? So I think they did a great job of taking those two Gaslight stories and the Catwoman stories, merging them together. The only thing is I just wish they would have laid a little bit, you know, a few more seeds along the way for the the changes that they made. It feels like it needs one more one more draft. Yeah, just like one, one more, more quick pass. pass just super quick pass. Fix the little things. Mm-hmm. 
and we'd all be happy. <laughs> right. Maybe And maybe just handing it to a different group of people, right? So you have your alpha readers who are people that read your novel or whatever, your script at early stages. And they point out the big, like, oh, this is a giant plot hole, right? Oh, gosh, I got to fix that. And then you have your beta readers who are should be a different group of readers as well. So they have fresh eyes on it, don't have the history of what they read before to be able to point it out. If you give a script to the same group of people and over and over again, the advantage is they see how the script evolves. The disadvantage is they may, may remember something you wrote in the first script that is not in the second script and fill in holes. And I think that may have happened in this case where they, or, you know, or they lost something in the animation direction with like Barbara's hair and stuff they could have fixed. But, you know, that kind of thing. But still good. Definitely worth watching. Uh, Rated R, remember that. But I I think it was solid. Not for the smalls. Not for the smalls. No. But definitely good. That's my rating. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, did did you have anything else to add? No. I think we're good. I think we've talked long enough. We have. We've definitely gotten a long one on this one. Well, I think we can wrap up this mission. I think everybody wants us to wrap up this mission and Zeta out of the watchtower. (laughs) Of course, the best way to support the show is to share it with a friend. You can also leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Ratings and reviews push us up in the search string and help new people find the show. Uh, And don't forget, you can now find all of our episodes divided into handy playlists at crashingthemode.com slash YouTube. And again, with huge thanks to Ryan Bolter and Richard Kreutz Landry for helping us make, make that happen and maintaining it as we move forward as well. You can find links to more information about this movie, its related comics, and other material down in the show notes for this episode. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to see more bonus content like this, please consider supporting us through Patreon at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well